Schönen guten Morgen. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to uh, lead you through the first two presentations. Uh, and the first one uh, I'd like to present or introduce is our keynote speaker, uh, Linda Gazzini, who had the longest trip coming from the West Coast of the United States. She's a professor of psychiatry, just a few words, um, at the Oregon Health and Science University and associate director of the Health Services Research and Development uh, at the Veteran of, Veterans Affairs Portland Healthcare System. Um, her research focuses on end-of-life issues, palliative care, and geriatric mental health, and she has published extensively very, very many uh, highly ranked um, articles on assisted suicide and the Oregon Death with Dignity Act, um, starting in 1996 with a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine until um, now. And um, uh, so we are very, very happy and honored that probably one of the worldwide experts on assisted suicide uh, came to us, to our conference in Munich. And um, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, Linda. Thank you very much. Bitte? In Berlin. In Berlin, sorry, in Berlin. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you so much for the invitation. I've had a lovely uh, 36 hours um, in Berlin, and uh, I want to thank the conference organizers for inviting me, and I want to thank the founder for supporting uh, this uh, event. Certainly my work early on was supported by um, uh, philanthropists in the United States, George Soros and the Soros Foundation Project on Death in America, and the Greenwall Foundation at a time when the uh, our large federal system, the NIH, would, would be, was unwilling to fund me. Um, so a couple other things. I do work for the Department of Veterans Affairs, which is a federal organization, so I'm required to tell you that everything I say may not be agreed upon by the United States government. Um, and uh, there's also, uh, I've, uh, instead of just putting all the, um, the publications in the slides, I've asked that there's a bibliography that's going to be posted of uh, the references. So, uh, does this work as a pointer? Oh, well. Okay, Oregon. It's up there on the right. If you know about American politics, um, that's one of the blue, the blue states. Okay, great. Uh, there, there it is. Um, and uh, a couple of things about Oregon. It's highly progressive legislation. We're one of the three states that have legalized marijuana um, and uh, many other. And we do that because we have, uh, in part, what's called a ballot referendum. So if um, a person has a good idea that they want to vote on in Oregon, they need to put together uh, this idea and have about several thousand people sign a petition, and then it will be voted on by the public. Um, the year that the Death with Dignity Act passed, there were 30 other ballot measures on the ballot that year, and like most of us then are just going kind of nuts the weeks before each um, election, trying to figure out how we will vote on these uh, different ballots. Um, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act passed in 1994, in political terms, it was what we call a squeaker. It barely passed, 51 to 49 percent. People were surprised. California and Washington had defeated similar measures just before that quite soundly. I think the um, opposition was caught um, unawares. Um, and for 15 years, Oregon stood alone. So Oregon had legalized uh, physician aid in dying um, uh, uh, apart from any other state until 2008 when the state of Washington legalized it. And since then, Vermont, through a different mechanism, has also um, legalized it. So those are the three states in which it has been explicitly um, legalized. What the law allows is a physician to prescribe a lethal dosage of medication for the purposes of self-administration. But there's a series of safeguards. Um, patient must be 18 years or older, 
a resident of the state of Oregon. This was to make sure that um, Oregon did not become a place with suicide clinics that people all over the country came for. Um, in order to prevent impulsive requests, the patient must make two written, two oral and one written request separated by 15 days. And then an attending physician, the primary physician, and a secondary physician must confirm that the patient has a terminal illness with likely death within six months, is capable of making um, uh, and communicating decisions. The decision is voluntary. The patient must be informed about um, alternatives such as hospice and comfort care alternatives, um, and must request but not require that the patient notify their family. In fact, about 94% of patients do notify their family of their choice. And then there's the psychiatric safeguard that says if there's concern about a mental disorder such as depression may be influencing the decision, the patient must be seen by a, a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, as, as in the law, it says that all physicians who prescribe must notify the Oregon Public Health Division um, and that the Oregon Public Health Division is required to publish statistics every year about the use of lethal prescriptions. If the legal requirements are not met, the physician may be reported to a state licensing board, and that has happened for fairly minor things, such as difficulties uh, with the witness signature, with no significant consequences yet to the physician. If this is not considered suicide under the law, the death certificate um, says that the patient died of the underlying medical illness, not physician aid in dying. And since the law uh, started in 1998, there have been um, 854 deaths, with a slow increase from one in a thousand deaths to three in a thousand deaths. Now, opponents of this say, will look at these statistics and say, oh, it's tripled in rate. But um, that's a misuse of statistics, of course, because these are very, very low rates. Um, So why Oregon? Why did Oregon pass this law, and why did it stand alone for so long? So, so Oregon is different than the other states on a variety of measures. One of them is Oregon, at the time the law passed, had very few ethnic minorities. So about 94% of Oregonians were um, Caucasian, and ethnic minorities in the United States support legalized assisted dying by about 20 points less. So if you're African American in the United States, your goals are to get medical care, not to get a lethal prescription. We um, are the great unchurched state. We have the lowest proportion of church-affiliated um, people in Oregon in the United States, and that increases um, every year. We have a, this long history of political innovation through the ballot measures. Opposition was caught unawares in 1994 when this passed. And we already had a very well-developed hospice system and low rates of in-hospital deaths. So a, a very strong shared belief in Oregon is the importance of dying at home, not in the hospital. And at the time the law passed, in fact, only 26% of deaths in Oregon were in hospital. So home deaths were common. And we have this ethos of rugged individualism that is common in the Western um, states. And I'll show you a little bit why. So this is Portland, where I live. This is where most people live in Oregon. And all anything with green in it is federal land for which no one lives on, or very sparsely. So there's, this is a very rural uh, state, sparsely populated. And people um, have this strong sense of depending on themselves, uh, not depending on the government. So when the law passed in 1994, I put together a um, series of um, studies started by uh, doing a survey of Oregon psychiatrists. That was because I'm a psychiatrist and that was where my interest laid, um, but followed by studies of Oregon psychologists. And then uh, two years after the law was enacted, we did a study of 4,000, every eligible physician in Oregon, 
um, about their experiences with the law. Um, at that point, oops, at that point, five percent had received a request from a patient. We followed up with um, a study of hospice nurses. So let me tell you a little bit about hospice in the United States. So it's a very um, um, when people go into hospice. They uh, go into hospice at the time they have less than six months of remaining life. They give up the idea of returning to the hospital or life-sustaining treatments. They're usually required to have a family member to assist them. And hospice is almost exclusively home hospice. So hospice nurses and social workers and a variety of people come to the patient's home several times a week daily at the, when they're getting more ill to deliver care. Um, the debate in Oregon had been hospice versus um, assisted suicide, but in fact it quickly became clear that most patients actually were enrolled in hospice at the time they made this, um, mis made this choice. 90% are hospice enrolled if they die by assisted suicide. And that is in part because our early studies show if you refer to hospice, that was the mechanism by which most people changed their mind or at least delayed thinking about um, a physician aid and dying. Um, so in 2001, we did a study where we found of all hospice nurses in Oregon, at that time almost half had cared for a client who had requested physician aid and dying, a third had cared for one who'd received a lethal prescription. We followed up with a study of hospice chaplains. And all of our survey have response rates of over 65%, suggesting that they're reliable. And luckily, we actually followed most of these studies up with qualitative interviews. Now, this was important because when we designed these surveys, they were based on national experts' ideas about what was important, why people made these requests. And then I began to meet the national experts, and they confided in me things like they'd actually never cared for a patient who requested assisted suicide. And what was bubbling up at that point was that the, these patients were quite different than, than had been um, expected, um, as I'll talk about. And so these qualitative interviews are important because they allow you to, to, to generate new hypotheses in a very rigorous way about um, what's going on. Uh, other studies, we did studies uh, early on of patients with um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or motor neuron disease about their views about wanting physician aid in dying. We did a study of 58 terminally ill people who actually made a request for physician aid in dying and then studies of family members for patients who'd made requests. So our studies uh, showed, first, uh, many of our early studies were about physicians and healthcare providers' attitudes. And our first studies of physicians, t over 2,600, showed that about 51 supported the, percent supported the law. Hospice nurses were very similar. A core third opposed the law. Hospice social workers were much more support supportive, and this probably reflects in the United States Social work training is very much focused on uh, patient autonomy uh, and patient self-determination, whereas a nursing care is much more focused on caring uh, for vulnerable patients. But interestingly, even in Oregon, 40% of hospice chaplains uh, supported uh, the law. Uh, Psychiatrists, 56% supported the law. This is interesting because one of the major roles of psychiatrists is to take care of suicidal patients and convince them to not commit suicide. But psychiatrists um, clearly believe there was a role for physician aid and dying in the face of terminal illness. And psychologists in Oregon overwhelmingly supported the law. So one of the concerns um, early in the debate about physician aid and dying is this idea that if you legalized it, it would undermine end-of-life care. That it was so much easier to give somebody a lethal prescription that why would we invest in the hard work of these difficult discussions about setting goals and treating pain. 
Um, so there was a lot of concern, and at that time, even though we had hospice, the whole concept of palliative medicine was in, was in its infancy. It wasn't even a certified medical specialty in the United States. Um, so in our study of Oregon physicians, uh, we tried to examine that, and we found that um, most of them reported um, that they, uh, since the law passed, were making 10, time, 10 times were making more referrals than making fewer, and that they had made substantial efforts to improve their knowledge um, of pain medications. Now, I don't think we can say this is because of the law. At that time, there was a broad emphasis across the nation on improving hospice referrals and improving ability to take care of people at the end of life. But I do think it really undermines any kind of attempt to say that the law um, worked against end of life care. And in our study of hospice nurses, we asked them about their perceptions of changes in physicians over the previous five years. Now, hospice in the United States has really grew out of a grassroots movement that was somewhat anti-medical. And believe me, hospice nurses um, do not give any slack to physicians. Um, but in fact, hospice nurses said in the, that in the previous five years, this was in uh, 2001, that they perceived that physicians were much more willing to refer to hospice, hospice, more knowledgeable about pain medications, more willing to care for hospice patients, and more competent in caring for hospice patients. And uh, many of them were neutral, and only a small percentage actually said that they were um, worse. So again, perceptions by nurses of broad improvements by physicians in their ability to take care for people at the end of life. Our studies of physicians on nurses also looked at, um, asked them how they would respond to caring for a patient who made a request for a lethal prescription. And even though 51% of physicians said they supported the law, only a third were willing to prescribe. This represents that um, many physicians still felt that there was potential adverse consequences for themselves to prescribing. And in addition, Many physicians worked for large Catholic hospitals that were able to contractually prevent physicians from participating in the law. Again, even though um, over a third of hospice nurses um, opposed the law, only 3% would actively oppose a client's choice um, for physician aid in dying. And 12% of hospice nurses and no chaplains would transfer a patient who received a lethal prescription. And um, this suggests that the, the ethic of non-abandonment um, ranked higher for these um, care providers than their opposition to physician um, aid and dying. Another concern, again, about legalization is that it would be easier, as I said, to simply give someone a lethal prescription than do the more difficult aspects of um, end-of-life care or find interventions. But in fact, about half of physicians said that they um, had uh, made a substantive intervention at the time of request, the request for assisted suicide to find an alternative. When they did, um, about half of the time, the interventions were successful in um, helping the patient change their mind. And the single most successful intervention was hospice referral. So if the patient made the request when they were already in hospice, they were unlikely to change their mind. But if they made the request before going into hospice, that hospice referral was the most effective way to find an alternative. And um, again, 90% of people who uh, die by physician aid in dying are enrolled in hospice. Um, so who are these people who make the requests, and why do they make requests? And this is from the Oregon Health Authority data. Um, the single most important predictive factor is education. So there was a concern that people who made requests were vulnerable, ethnic minorities, poorly educated, women, people who could not access and did not have the ability to access good end-of-life care, who would default to physician aid in dying. But in fact, people who died were eight times more likely to have a bachelor's degree than those who didn't. And every uh, level 
of master's degrees and doctorates increases the risk of physician um, aid in dying. Um, so that low education is protective. Um, <laughs> people who make these requests are overwhelmingly Caucasian. Of the 859 deaths, there only has been one African American. There was equally divided between men and women. And in the United States, um, certainly at this time, the biggest risk was that you have, would default to a physician aid in dying because you did not have health care insurance and could not access good end of life care. But in fact, only 2% of the requesting patients had no health insurance. In all of our studies, uh, no matter who we're asking, we ask about religiousness. And we use the same scale. It's a 1 to 10 scale where 10 is religion is important in my life and 0 is religion isn't important in my life. And in the United States, um, so most of our studies are, uh, show that it's around 6. So hospice nurses have a mean of 6. Caregivers of ALS and cancer patients a mean of 7. But the requesting patients are among the least religious pa group that we've ever had contact with. It's people who make these requests, and we know from many other uh, studies that um, religious affiliation is strongly protective against suicide. And it's also protective um, uh, against uh, requesting physician aid in dying. So why do people make these requests? Well, one of the debates was people are requesting this because of an untreated pain. And the uh, proponents would say, we can treat pain. And the opponents would say, well, you actually can't treat all pain. And it turns out that pain is irrelevant to requests for physician aid and dying. At the time of the requests, we asked people about their current symptoms where um, the, about, and the relationship to the request, where five it is very important and one it is not important. And at the time people make the requests, they're almost completely a, physically asymptomatic. They um, have been diagnosed with cancer, that it is advanced, they understand it's terminal, but they are still quite vigorous, which you kind of need to be to get through this process. But they are very much worried about future symptoms. And it's these future symptoms of pain that um, are motivating them. And as I'll show, it's really pain's ability to undermine independence, to make you dependent on other people, to cause you to lose control, that is the key issue there. One of the concerns is that patients make these requests because they feel that they are a burden to other people. And in fact, on these um, one to five measures, uh, physicians, patients who make requests rank at about a three. They are concerned that they are a burden to other people. And I've interviewed so many of them, and they say, I don't want to be a burden to my family. And their family's in the background, and they're rolling their eyes. Because they've told the patient a million times that they're not a burden. And in fact, these are very crusty, individualistic people who've never let anybody take care of them in their whole life. And their family would like the opportunity to take care of them. And hospice nurses agree with that. They said that um, you know, only 16% of uh, physician aid and dying patients, the family was um, less, found po less positive meaning in caring for the patient. And in only... Um, 11% were they more burdened by caring for the ill family member compared to other hospice patients. And only 3% were they more burdened by the cost of care compared to other hospice patients. So patients may say, I don't want to burden people, but family members are universally are saying, we, this person is not a burden and we'd like the opportunity to care for them. One of my major concerns as a psychiatrist was the role of mental illness and depression. 
We know that depression and hopelessness are the single most important risk factors for completed suicide, and that suicide interventions are very effective. If you look at people who are hospitalized with serious suicidal ideation and you follow them long term, they have a high rate of completed suicide, but 85% will never be hospitalized again and will not complete suicide. Interestingly though, uh, hospice social workers who have pretty good training in uh, caring for mental illness and terminally ill patients rated the importance of depression in the request as a one, as the least important factor in all of the factors we um, had them measure. And in the requesting patient study, we found that about a quarter of the patients who made requests had serious clinical depression. What's interesting about that is that's about the rate of serious clinical depression in terminally ill patients, suggesting that, so, that depression may not increase the risk um, of requests for physician aid in dying. But in this group of people, there were three seriously depressed people who we um, um, participated in our study, received lethal prescriptions within a month of our study, and died very quickly from um, physician aid in dying suggesting that the, the psychiatric safeguard was um, ineffective um, in preventing this from, ha this from happening. Now, of course, it's a little more complicated than that. One of these patients actually was um, a 10-year volunteer for Compassion and Choices. Um, she said she thought depression was affecting her decision, and as she left are um, my suite of research offices. She noticed the uh, little ad on the, um, uh, the wall for my other study, which was a treatment for, of methylphenidate uh, for uh, depression in cancer patients. She said, am I eligible for that study? And I said, you certainly are. She entered that study, she got methylphenidate, she got her depression completely treated. It was quite effective. It was the only effective time in it, that study that anybody got better. But um, she still chose a physician aid in dying then several months um, after that. So it's complex. The two other people said, yes, we're depressed, but we don't think it's affecting um, our decision. And they could, again, show these other characteristics that were um, predominant. The other important thing about these depressed people, though, is if they had screened with a simple depression measure, that would have clearly identified the need for psychiatric um, uh, further psychiatric evaluation. So instead of coming away from this thinking that everyone needs to be evaluated by a mental health professional, I came away thinking we need to do a better job of screening who should be seen by a mental health professional. So if it's not, if it's not really depression, if it's not poor end-of-life care, if it's not physical symptoms, why do people make these requests? And uniformly, across all the interviews, no matter how we ask the question, surveys, qualitative interviews, what came across is this is a group of people who've had a lifelong value about being in control, about being independent, about not wanting to depend on other people's, and who want to clearly be in the driver's seat um, when they um, are leaving this life because they've been in the driver's seat for their entire life. So they rated being in control, being independent, uh, not wanting to care for themselves in the future as the single most important things. And in fact, if you look at the control of circumstances of death, it not only has a median of five, this interquartile range, the range from the 24 five to 75 percent is four to five, and it suggests uniformly people want, feel that staying in control is the major reason that they are making these requests. And hospice nurses um, agreed. They said that 77 percent of patients who made requests feared loss of control of circumstances of death compared to other hospice patients. Now, as I said, 
um, we followed up these surveys with qualitative um, studies. Now the nice thing about qualitative studies is if they agree with your quantitative studies, it gives us richness and it gives the opportunity for um, hearing something that gives you that aha um, experience. And so these are a few quotes, each from a different physician about a different patient who'd made a request for physician aid in dying. The first physician said, who'd gotten several requests and who opposed physician aid in dying, this is the most unlucky physician. He hated the thought of physician aid in dying. He got three requests within the first two months of the law being legalized. And he wrote, but these were individuals who wanted to control their lives, and it was a mostly a control issue. And they sort of stated it up front, and it had nothing to do with the care they were getting. And they would return to it and return to it. And you could say, you know we're doing all we can. We're making this commitment to you, and we're trying to take care of you know. But they sort of, they sort of fixated on ending their lives from the get-go. Another physician. I think her big fear was loss of control. She wanted to control things right up to the end. She wanted to plan it. She wanted things to go the way she wanted it to. And she didn't want to wait. She did not want to take a chance of waiting until she could not be under her control anymore. She was very in charge. But you know, most people like that can be a little difficult to deal with, but she was not like that at all. This is from a hospice nurse about a requesting patient. He was a very stable patient. He wasn't in a lot of pain physically, but he was the captain of his boat. And that's how he had been his entire life. And he wanted to die a certain way, and he did it. And he just wanted to have the ultimate control. Another physician, another patient. So she was a big control person. You know, I'm talking big time control. I'm in charge here. She sort of self-directed her medical care. She was a nurse. People not only value control, but they're very persuasive and determined. This is not something they ask lightly. They keep coming back to it. Um, to, um, and this is how they've approached problems um, for most of their life. Um, and I think you kind of have to be to get through this process, um, which has several physicians, a waiting period, witnesses, legalized signatures, um, finding the right physician, finding a willing pharmacist. Um, one physician wrote, they're really not able to think or talk about things like hospice until they know that this other issue has been taken care of. It's almost a condition for them to get palliative care, to know that there's something to let to let them out of it in case they get stuck. Another physician. Well, I've tried to, I learned very quickly how on the first couple of visits when I tried to talk somebody out of it and really assess their motivation. And the patients were quite resentful of that. Another physician. Because this lady is so determined and there's no way we can talk her out of it, she was very adamant. Another physician, he was an autonomous person. He made his own choices. He did not meet the requirements because he did not have less than six months to live. So I counseled him again and again and again. And again and again and again, he said that he demanded this. So a summary of the findings. Patients request physician aid in dying because they have a strong need for control, pride, self-sufficiency, want to avoid being dependent on others, struggle to find meaning in the dying process, fear worsening symptoms, dread the future, and have a lack of denial about their terminal illness. There's no evidence that legalized physician aid in dying undermines development of end-of-life care, there is no evidence that it's used um, predominantly in any kind of vulnerable populations. There's no evidence that relatives feel burdened by caring for these patients. But there are a small number of depressed patients who access lethal prescriptions 
who would be um, identified by better screening and might be, have improved quality of life through depression treatment. I think the more important, the greatest importance of this work is not really about physician aid and dying, but certainly in the United States, we have developed a system of hospice and comfort care that focus, focuses on palliation of symptoms, that fo focuses on the family, that focuses on spiritual issues. But there's a small group of people for whom end of life care, good end of life care is about less care and more independence and control. And hospice is not geared up to, um, to, to deliver that. As one hospice nurse said, we need to look at that population and see if there's something we can do as well for them as we've done for people with pain. I suspect there is more we could do to allow them to die naturally and address their need for control. And I want to thank my many co-investigators. Thank you. For this wonderful presentation, um, giving us insights into the uh, Oregon situation. And thank you also for uh, watching the time. This leaves us um, about 10 minutes for questions yes. uh, and discussion. We have two microphones in the middle. Um, so if um, anyone wants to pose a question, please um, come in the middle and identify us, yourself, stating your name, where you come from, and um, um, we're looking forward to it. Please, use the microphone. Yes. So we have a live stream broadcast, um, just to let you know. Excellent question and a complicated question. So um, clinically in the United States, people uh, are competent to make a medical decision if they understand the decision, they can under weigh the risks, benefits, and alternatives, they can appreciate the information, which means to apply it to their self, and they're not impacted by uh, delusional um, thinking. So. The competence part is pretty straightforward then. It's that you understand this medication may cause your death. You understand the risks of, um, of emesis, of failure, that you actually may wake up and it won't work. Uh, you understand that um, the facts that apply to most people apply to you, and you don't have delusions. So that's the competence part. The depression part is a little more difficult because what we're looking for is, well, it's fairly straightforward to diagnose depression. Um, those are people who are sad and blue and depressed out of uh, unusually to a severe degree for several weeks. That is different than the sense of sorrow many um, terminally ill people feel. Um, um, they can still experience pleasure in things um, that depressed people can't. And then the question is, is how depression impacts the decision. Is it an authentic decision based on the person's lifelong values versus a uh, decision of hopelessness that's, you know, that's impacted by the depression? And I have come to the conclusion that you, we can't figure that out. And that if you have significant clinical depression, no matter how the law is written, you should be excluded from, from the law. Now this, I see many problems with that in that depression causes as much suffering as physical illness at the end of life. Um, and I have to admit that ultimately I'm biased is that if I accept that depressed people can make this choice, that's hard for me to do my job as a psychiatrist. 
And so I have these conflicts of interest in even examining that. So it's a complicated question. And even though I'm the best person to answer it, I'm the, I'm the worst person to answer it. We have four more questions. Maybe you should start with Bettina because of uh, the problems working, or? OK. Claudia? So. OK. So Orban would be the first. Aid or Medicare, uh -huh. and uh, she got a letter where Medicaid or Medicare uh, uh, reported about, the, informed her about the options she had. And among these options was physician assisted suicide, which was covered. Mm -hmm. And the German press always interprets this case as a case of pressure on the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen the original letter, and unfortunately, it's not published in the internet. So. Can you inform me about the case? Is there any pressure by Medicaid or Medicaid to, to use the option of physician-assisted suicide? Right. I have seen the letter. It was dopey. They should, it was dumb. They shouldn't have said that. They thought they were giving people alternatives. Um, but, and they didn't read it as that way. As soon as it was brought to the press, they changed the letter. It no longer um, mentions that. And it was, uh, I think, just, and I know the person who was the head of the Oregon Health Commission when it was done, he was completely embarrassed about the letter. So it no longer um, happens, and it shouldn't have happened, because it was, it was the wrong thing to say. Bettina Schöne-Seifert from Münster. Uh, Mr. Gancini, I would first like uh, to use this occasion to express my gratitude for your long list of Oregon publications. For those of us who are argue and fight for PAD, this has really been an invaluable resource. So thanks for that. Uh, and here my question. I would like to know if from your personal experience, uh, you are still in favor of the terminality confinement, the six months life expectancy formula. Are you in favor of it? Or would you rather prefer to get rid of that restriction? And with which arguments? Say, thank you. So let me just say that for the most part, it has been a privilege doing this research. It has been so interesting. Um, and I have always been an intensely curious person. But be that as it may, I don't have a lot of opinions um, about how the law should change. I feel that my job is more to, um, to comment on the law and to see what works, what doesn't work. Um, I've been particularly interested in why people would make this choice. I think that's my mental health background. So regarding the six month criteria, I don't have a position really either way, except to say that if you disentangle, if you say something different than six months, like a year, you have the risk of a group of patients who want um, a lethal prescription but, are, but can't access hospice yet. And I think the ability to access good end of life care is really important. And in the United States, hospice is the Cadillac of care. I guess you call it the Mercedes Benz of care. It is what the best we have to offer. And I would be very uncomfortable with um, anything that allowed people to um, access physician aid in dying, but not access the best end of life care. Now, let me just add, I would be delighted if hospice changed its criteria to allow people to come in earlier, because it is such a, I mean, the problem with hospice in my patients is they go into hospice, they get such good care that they get better and they have to get discharged from hospice. And it really shows that it's really not what we do in the ICU that counts. It's really what we do in terms of good basic nursing care that is important to improving people's lives when they're terminally ill. Let's go to Hunder from uh, Munich. Um, you pointed out uh, that uh, the most important um, 
motives for the request for physician aid in dying is uh, the fear of future uh, symptoms, uh, the loss of independency, and the feeling of perhaps being a burden to the family. And do you think that it could be an alternative to the death uh, medication or the death pill to work on these issues uh, in a th psychotherapeutic and spiritual way? Because um, dealing with one's own death, everything is, uh, it, it is a loss of control normally we can't control our, our own deaths. So perhaps uh, there could be a psychotherapeutic and spiritual alternative to the death pill. What do you think about this? Well, I would both agree and disagree. Um, so I agree that um, a lifetime of having such emphasis on control can make one very successful in a variety of ways but is limiting in some ways. It's really hard to have a, a good relationship with everybody when you're so focused on control and um, all of that. So I would agree that um, offering people psychotherapeutic um, interventions um, is important. But on the other hand, where I come from, the people who have this high value on independence and self-sufficiency are admired in our communities. They're admired in the West. And I think it's problematic to admire people lifelong for those values and then say when they're terminally ill uh, that it's suddenly psychopathological. Because it seems a natural it makes no sense considering how they lived their life. So, um, you know, when I'm interacting with people who want physician named Dime, I'm always gently looking for, trying to help them see that they could go a little longer. That, because I wanna help people with their fears. But ultimately, I don't see my job as whether, uh, my success is not whether they change their mind or not. My job is that they make the decision um, without as many, not in a state of anxiety and depression or some other, something else that could be addressed. So the last question comes from Christoph Oskarte. Yeah, Christoph Oskarte from Erlangen, palliative care physician. Thank you very much for your interest, uh, interesting data. I have two questions. First one probably is quite easy to answer. The second is, I guess, a little bit more complicated. The first one is, could you give us an insight? How was the legal situation on suicide before you had uh, 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 the legislation on phys physician-assisted dying? And the second question is, and I think uh, this is a very crucial point, uh, on uh, patients with depression and physician-assisted physician suicide, as you said it. You, you, uh, as I know, there are only... Let me, let me answer the first yeah. question first so I actually remember okay. it. Before. <laughs> um, before legalization in Oregon, we know a couple of things. There were studies done in Washington, Oregon, and nationally that showed that physicians were prescribing illegally and probably at a higher rate than the rest of the United States. The question was, uh, was it legal to, 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 to perform suicide? No, it was, it, it was not legal. Okay. They were doing it, they were putting themselves at risk. Yeah, this is a very important information for the German discussion as in Germany, suicide is not illegal. So it, it is here different as it was in Oregon before right. you had no, the legalization. No, suicide, so if somebody tries to commit suicide and fails, it's not gonna, they're not gonna be arrested and sent to jail. But a physician who gives a lethal prescription before that was at risk of losing their license and going to jail. 
Okay, thank you. It was more complicated than I thought. Uh, okay, I tried to have my second question very short because we uh, uh, have uh, little time. There are only a few people seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist, uh, a patient that commits suicide. Uh, could you give us an answer why there are so few people seeing uh, a psychiatrist or a psychologist? Right. So it is very low. Though the, the Oregon Health data only reports people who got lethal prescriptions in psych psychiatrists. So there may be many patients who saw psychiatrists and the psychiatrist said that they couldn't get the prescription and that we, would, we don't know that number, okay? But I think that's also low. Um, so again, patients are embedded in hospice systems with clinical social workers who are probably very competent at what they do. And I did a study, when I did the study of psychiatrists, I found that only a few actually cared for terminally ill patients. Uh, so if it was my grandmother, I'd rather see a hospice social worker than a psychiatrist in Oregon um, because of the just the greater experience. But I think the other reason it's hard to find a psychiatrist to do uh, this work, it's laborious, and patients find it offensive. They find it offensive that they should need to see a psychiatrist in order to, so they often decline. And then most of the patients don't seem depressed and seem quite convincing in, in their capacity. So I think there's a combination of reasons why it's low. It should probably be higher, but I don't think that it's, I don't think that every patient needs to see a mental health professional. Thank you once again, Linda. Um, let's try one quickly. Very grateful to have you here, and I'm sure there will be some questions coming up in the break. So, our next.